Good morning, everybody. I am not Jonathan Hudson. I am his stunt double. Uh, my name is John Fauche, for those of you that don't me, don't know me. So we have three great speakers here, and it looks like a pretty decent crowd. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, we have Arlando Teller. He's a recently elected state representative of Arizona. And to his left, Mark McClarty, uh, the FAA regional manager here for the Western Pacific region. And to the, my far left, we have uh, Chris Schmalz. He is uh, the legal counsel for Tucson Airport uh, Authority, one of, one of the legal counsels. So uh, as you heard in the last session, you know, we got a lot of changing things in alternative delivery. Um, we got a lot of changing in uh, regulations, um, funding mechanisms, you name it. So what we got here is uh, each speaker is going to speak approximately 20 minutes to give us a little bit of time at the end for a Q&A, but it's a pretty much an open mic for each one of them um, and to uh, bring up the topics of things that they're working on and uh, hopefully share some new information with you this morning. So I'd like to uh, welcome Orlando up here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yat Epine, good morning. My name is Orlando Teller. Nash Ejatachi Nin Shlon Tohad Lini Bashishin, Torichini Dashiche Doshin Dashinale Ekut Adanenshle. I just introduced myself in a proper Navajo uh, introduction, which is my clans, my mother's clans, my father's clans, and my mother's grandparents, and my father's grandparents' clan. Um, and I sincerely appreciate uh, Danette and Aza to introduce, uh, to invite me here today in this beautiful uh, uh, resort. Um, it's one heck of a drive, let me tell you, after you, after you leave the main intersection. So pretty windy, um, but it's beautiful. So as Mr. Fischer mentioned, uh, I am newly elected. The, the uh, 2019 legislative session was my first, I was literally first ever legislative session. Um, as a freshman, I introduced 11, uh, I primed 11 bills. And one of them, actually two of them, uh, was uh, aviation focus. One of them was uh, an appropriation of $65 million uh, to the aviation fund uh, program. Of course, uh, some of the ranked members said, Mr. Teller, you're too enthusiastic. <laughs> well, you all, most of you know me, and I am, and I thought it was reasonable after the many years of sweeping that the state legislators have done to the state aviation fund program. So the other bill was to close the gap on the sweeping. And um, so one of the two didn't make it to a hearing. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to introduce an anti-aviation sweep bill for the next session. And so I need your help with that. I need your help as not only uh, in the aviation community, but as residents and citizens of Arizona, speak to your representatives and let them know that you support Mr. Teller's bill on anti-sweep. That's really important because they, you are their boss. You voted them in. Whether you voted for them or not, they still represent you. And that's what I remind myself every day when I go to public events or to just go to the grocery store back home that the constituents of Legislative District 7 uh, are my bosses. So I've been working really closely with folks in District 7, also the aviation in, uh, community, in stakeholder communication, stakeholder meetings, and really getting to the crux of what I'm going to introduce next year. I'm also going to introduce another another appropriation bill for another 10 million. I hear and I heard from Don that with ADOT that um, he's already have, he already has a lineup of projects. So what I shared with um, uh, Don is that by September, give me a list of projects that are going to be, um, that, that this funding um, supports, this funding uh, takes care of. That way, I take a piece of paper with the positive notes, attach it to the bill, and go after another 10 million for next session. It's really important for us and for me to really express this 
to the state legislators, uh, most of them who supported me. Again, I said I had 11 bills that I primed. Of the 11 bill, as a freshman Democrat in a Republican-led House, five of them left the chamber. Of the five that left the chamber and went across to the Senate, one of them was signed by the governor. And I attribute that to my social, you know, just a social butterfly, working the room, talking across the aisle, establishing relationships, hanging out with them, going to cocktail hours, going to dinners with them, letting them know, when I'm saying them, the Republicans know, that I am um, pragmatic and I'm working for the best interests of the state. And so, <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna still do that for next session. I'm gonna introduce a aviation bill, two more, um, and one of them is appropriation for another 10 million, the other is the anti-sweep uh, bill. I'm also um, asking for the community, aviation community's assistance in sitting with me um, before the beginning of January 2020 um, to let me know what you would like to, for me to sponsor. Um, because it's really important that um, I hear what you want for your communities, for your airports. I'm also on the Transportation Committee and the Land and Ag uh, Committee. So uh, my voice on those committees are pretty uh, loud and poignant. Uh, I think uh, I do have the most transportation experience on those committees, well, the Transportation Committee. So I'm able to uh, use that experience, aviation experience and the transportation experience to uh, help uh, uh, educate and also reinforce some of the the presentations and the discussions while we're in committee. So, um, so that's that's what I've been doing, um, and I'm also on the aviation caucus, working really closely with uh, uh, members of the House and the Senate, and ensuring that we continue talking and engaging with the aviation and aerospace industry. It's really important that we support, well, it's really important that I share with them that we need to support uh, Arizona suppliers and manufacturers in the aerospace, but at the same time, we need to support the aviation network in Arizona as a major factor in the economic impact for the state. I have to remind my colleagues that we have to assure that we have to support it. The jobs do not create themselves. We in this room create the jobs that then go back to the community in some fashion. One of us helps the industry by going to the grocery store, this conference uh, with, the, with the hotels. So in any, in, in any fashion, we all in the aviation community are an impact to the community that we work in or go and host a conference at. So um, our little hands actually do a lot for the state. So I sincerely appreciate all of you coming in from all over the state and all over the region. So, um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, as I said, as a freshman, um, learned a lot. I had like 6,000 things coming to me at one instant. So um, I had to pull myself back. There was a point within the first month I had to um, step back. And, and this is how I normally share with my kids, uh, my niece and my nephew, is that um, your uncle had to step to the tree line and look down into the valley and see what the folks were doing down there. At that point, metaphorically, I was sharing this with them. I pointed out who I need to talk to directly and miss, don't miss around with the kerfuffle that was happening in the valley, I went straight to those players that have become my colleagues, my friends, and my supporters. And that includes Democrat and Republican efforts <clears throat> for each of the bills that I, I introduce. So um, with that, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Good morning. 
Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, this has been a great conference, and I said in a, quite a few of the sessions yesterday, I mean, awesome sessions. So I just want to thank you for that. I was really interested in the theme, <laughs> the, the theme Back to the Future. So when I was asked um, by Danette if I would be willing to sit on this panel, I was trying to think, okay, so what should I talk about? Is it regulator? Should I talk about me being a regulator or what? So we kind of talked it through a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to share some of the things that's going on um, in the Western Pacific region in particular, maybe a little bit nationally. And um, I do want to spend this time just to kind of put a couple things in perspective. And I'm going to use the theme to do that. So I just want to say this first of all, and I think most of you know, have worked with us in the past. On one hand, we are regulators in the FA, but on the other hand, we work for you. So yeah, we regulate you when it comes to your grant assurances, we're in your business, I know. Uh, for part 139, um, of course, that's a regulatory program, so we're involved in that. But a lot of my time is also spent um, trying to um, work together with you to try to help you get through your local processes and to try to get you to the federal system. Because we all have a common interest, and that's to try to build the aviation system as strongly as possible. So I want to talk about that real quick, but first I want to just do a few housekeeping things. Um, some of you may know, some may not know. Uh, we've made a selection for the San Francisco Airport District Office, and I'd like for Lori Suttmeyer to stand up. <laughs> so after months of pain, she finally got through, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we're happy. Uh, what we noticed is that the Phoenix office and the San Francisco office are significantly um, short-staffed. And, and some of it's been the struggles of trying to get staffing through the new system, because now we've got to go through the department. Uh, but we've got clearance now. So we're moving full speed ahead to do a lot of year in hiring to try to staff both of those offices. So I really appreciate you and your patience uh, in those two offices in particular, as we try to work through some of your issues. Um, some of you know Charlotte Jones, she's our lead search inspector. She took over after Steve Utzel. Charlotte was, Charlotte was with us before she came back. We're really happy to have her. We're fully staffed in that arena. Um, so those are two good things that I think are happening. Um, Staffing-wise, it's going to help us serve you better, both on the regulatory side, but also helping you get through some of your issues. Um, just want to mention real quickly about our airports conference. I, I haven't sent anything out yet, but these presentations and the photos are on the website. <laughs> One day I get around to sending it out, but I just want to let, the, let you know that. So I want to talk a little bit about funding first of all. Um, back to the future. So I, I, I started in 2003, and I said, let me look and see how much money do we have in the IP for this region in 2003. When I came on board, it was about $390 million for the region, which I thought was very low for a region this size. Back in those days, uh, some of the challenges we had was that people generally did, generally did not understand how federal decisions were made. Um, I think a lot of people thought if you go to the division manager, you can get your money, and that's not the way it is. <laughs> and that's not the way it is today, and that's not the way it should have been back then. Uh, so we didn't really have the process that's really laid out as clearly so folks know how to get more money. Um, we were missing deadlines, and Generally speaking, people weren't paying attention, none of us were, in the FA side as well, to grant management. So we started this effort back then to try to educate everybody on some of the metrics that we're looking at in the FA to try to help this region compete better. That's around the time we started the best practice effort, building the best practice guides for Arizona and California. And I looked and I said, 2003, 2005, 2005 was our high. We got 531 million in 2005. And in the two or three years around that, it was around 500 million plus or minus 20. We've since kind of gone backwards again. Last year, 423 million. 423 million. So I go back to what I said before. A region this size should be doing 500 million plus. But what I've kind of been noticing is that we've kind of gotten away from some of the metrics again. And I know we talk about it at the conferences, but I really want to help you understand these metrics make a difference. Um, we do look at grant performance. Headquarters looks at grant performance. Everybody has access to it now. So when we talk about drawdown rates, we talk about closing out old projects, that's important. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is we want to 
run the program like an investment banker. When you go to an investment banker and you want money, they do look at your track record to make sure you can pay it. Well, in our case, you're not paying it, but we're looking at track record. We're looking at a business plan. You know, if you, if you want money for something, is it justification kind of well thought out and presented? Okay, you're not gonna get any argument with me about need because I know there's need in this region. But how it's packaged and how it's presented goes a long way towards articulating the game plan on your end to us that you're ready to go. And we were doing that back in those earlier days when we were focusing on that a lot better uh, than we seem to be doing now. And I think we're trying to work on getting back to that again. Um, we're looking at financial plans. So what's the backup? If this important is really important, what's the backup plan if we can't get you federal funding? Obviously, we're going to try to, but if this is really important, if you're going to present it that way, there should be a backup plan. Um, phasing, we look at phasing. So one of the things that we've been talking about, we mentioned this at our FA conference and also in Monterey, is that we are, we are, we being the FA, are working together with the consultant community to talk through some of these things and try to see if we can kind of work together on the alignment of our priorities and kind of what you have to go through to get your, pack, your, your projects together. Um, I'll say it again, um, we're leaving about $80 million on the table a year that we should be able to get. Um, and again, I, I, there is need out here. There is need in this region. So it was just interesting when I went back to just kind of look and see kind of how the trajectory of funding for the region. I would just say this to you. Uh, we've got clear dates that we talk about all the time. If you're not sure what the dates are for getting your grants in place in order for 2020, and maybe this year as well, please talk to your ADO. Those dates are important. The reason why they're important is because there's critical decisions being made shortly after those dates end. And if we're missing those dates, we're blowing through them, you know, then a lot of these projects aren't being considered when the money's robust. And then you're competing when it's less. And it's a national program. So everybody's competing nationally on this. So it's really important to just sit down with the ADO management, talk about it, make sure you understand the dates. If we can do anything to help you, I mean, please reach out to us. But I can't stress that enough. It's, it's, it's extremely important. So another thing I want to talk about, um, Alondo talked about uh, the sweeps in Arizona. And I really want to applaud you, Alondo. Uh, and I know we have some ASA reps here as well, ASA as well, um, for their efforts in Arizona. And we, I want to talk about California, for the people here from California, and just kind of give you an update on what's going on in California, because some things have happened since our FA conference that I want to make you aware of. But I, with respect to Arizona, I want to say that we are here and ready to assist as we're, gonna, as we're doing in California, if we're asked. So just, I mean, I think when Kurt Schaefer was at our conference, he made it real clear what he thinks about revenue diversion. He feels it's stealing. He made that really clear. And having him as an associate administrator and someone who feels that strongly, and you know, a lot of times when you get politicals, you can do things that the careers can't do because they are aligned with the administration. We're in the best position that we've ever been to go after this, and we are. So since the um, conference, so prior to the conference, FA sent the state of California a letter, and it letter also went to Illinois and a couple other states, basically saying their action plan they presented is not adequate, and they're not complying. In July, I participated in a meeting in DC with the um, Department of Finance, California Department of Finance, and they wanted clarification on the, um, on the policy, so they asked a lot of clarification questions. But by all metrics, they appear like they're interested, willing, and intending on complying with, with the federal policy. So what we spent a lot of our time talking about was how do we quantify how much money is actually collected and that's been a challenge, and we're going to need your help on that. Um, you may, for the part 139 airports, you may see us, or you may hear us going out to you, because you should have some, some records of fuel sales. 
and some of the GAs may have it as well. But um, we're committed to working with the airlines, the A4A, to see what they have in terms of their records, and with the airport community, and with the state of California, to quantify exactly how much is being collected in California. It's interesting that we don't have a agreed upon number, but everybody agreed that we need to get that and that we're gonna work towards getting that. The second thing they talked about, they being DOF, California Department of Finance, was they asked will we be willing to look at any um, offsets. So we said, well, what do you mean? So recognizing that some of these funds were collected through referendums um, in the state of California to go towards you know, uh, first responders, schools, you know, it's kind of tricky on how they're gonna figure this out. So they were asking questions like, well, if we can find a way, there's some, we understand that there are some challenges in, in using money for surface transportation, but there are some airports that have surface transportation challenges in California. Instead of us giving state money for whomever, can we use some of this revenue for that purpose if it's benefiting the airport? So, I mean, we're, we're open to hearing what they're gonna propose, so we didn't say yes, we didn't say no, but they threw it out as a possible offset. Um, I threw out the fact that the California Air Resources Board recently um, passed a regulation to mandate zero emission vehicles in California which makes the California airports uneligible for bail money once that's implemented. So if the state wants to use those type of revenues for something like that, it's benefiting the airport community, that may be something that they can look at as well. So we didn't solve that problem, but we all agreed that we'll be open to listening to proposals on offsets, if it makes sense, um, once we get the dollar amount. And overall, it was supposed to be a one-hour meeting, it ended up being a two-hour meeting. So it, it actually went really well. So one of the things I brought up towards the end was how I did an analysis back four years ago when we were trying to meet with the old administration and looking at the California state funding program and how low it was funded. I compared it to the other 50 states. And it was, it was like in the bottom, the bottom 10th. And it was their belief that they're matching every federal dollar with state with a state share, and I said, that's not happening. And I said, in California, that's not happening. And I said, also, you know, we're hearing that some of the smaller airports aren't accepting grants because they can't meet the 10%. But I said, I can tell you right now, if you think <laughs> you're giving state money, matching every federal dollar we're giving, you're not. And again, that hurts the bottom line as well because there's a need out there, we can't get to it. That's not, they said that was not their intent. So I made a commitment to go back up and meet with the DOF. Right now we're collecting that over with Caltrans and some of my team. Just to kind of look at what we funded over the last five years with federal money, what the state funded, just to demonstrate that it's not a match for match. And I'm hoping that that leads to a conversation that we're gonna probably need the airport community to get involved in, in California, what to do about it. So these are some good things I think that are going on that I think are gonna be beneficial. Um, it's gonna take some time to kind of work through it, but at least we're, we're making progress working with the state of California we weren't before. Um, so I think that's a good news story and more to come on that. Hopefully by the time I go to my next conference, we'll have a little bit more to report on. The third thing I want to talk about briefly, um, some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not be. So less than a year ago, about a year ago, um, our air traffic organization, after realizing <laughs> that we're just getting burned with all the noise complaints in the agency, um, with, with the next gen and the changes and approaches and things of that nature. So they reached out to me and my counterpart in the Northwest Mountain region and asked, would we be willing to bring some airport sponsors? And at the time, we were looking at the core 30 airports in this region, um, but they didn't include Honolulu, they looked at the ones on the mainland, so San Diego. LAX, San Francisco, Phoenix, Las Vegas. If we, I would be willing to see if they would meet with the FAA and we sit down and we talk about what was going on because it's eating all of our lunch. See if we can strategize, learn how to work together. So we started that process. Our fourth meeting is gonna take place in August in San Francisco because we're rotating it around the service area. And since then, we've expanded the group of airports. 
Um, the second meeting, I was able to bring Oakland and San Jose in, because you can't talk about San Francisco airspace and noise without looking at those, because it's the same community. And then in the basin, the, the Lone Beaches, the John Wayne's, the Burbanks, Ontario's. So we got them involved. In our, in our um, August meeting, we're gonna bring in Tucson, Reno, Sacramento, Honolulu, in this, part, in this region, and then Boise, Colorado Springs, and Portland, and Salt Lake City, up in Northwest Mountain, and Anchorage. So what I wanna say about this effort, and again, what we're, part of what we're trying to do, and I, I've always said when I come that this, this is a business of relationships, and learning to trust each other, and learning how to work together to get through <laughs> all the things we have to jointly get through, whether it's local or federal, state. So a couple of good things that's coming from that is, um, we've been talking about the gateway, the, the, the flight procedures gateway, where before they had, air traffic had 40,000 requests. The requests can come in from airlines, they can come in from tenants, they can come in from airports, come from FA. They were just processing them. They had no idea how to process them, what to do about them. And by getting the airports involved, we're trying to figure out what makes sense in terms of giving at least these airports, and we'll see what happens later, but we're starting with these airports. An understanding of what's happening with the gateway and get them involved to kind of help FA know that this is good, this is bad, stay away from this area before we just jump out and do things. I think that's gonna make a big difference. <laughs> um, so we're reporting back on that and I think that's making some progress. Uh, we're also spending a lot of time talking about partnership versus collaboration. Why is it a big issue? We're looking for an 80% solution that we all could agree on. We're not gonna agree on 100%. There will be times when FA is gonna go ahead and do something because for safety reasons it has to. But when that happens, there will be a communication, there'll be an outreach effort. There's gonna be times when the airport is not gonna be able to support something publicly that the FAA is doing. That happens. But we're still gonna talk and strategize. That's what we're trying to create. So, um, more to come on that, but I did wanna just share that with you because, I mean, it, it is happening and we're really proud of it. And um, I'm hoping that that's gonna bring some benefits as well to all of us. So with that, I want to give up my time. And Chris, I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Tucson. Hopefully everybody's having a good time. Did uh, you go to Flanderell Planetarium last night? Lard well, how did you enjoy that? It's a great place. Um, yeah, absolutely. One of, the gems, one of the gems of the city. We have a lot of uh, things that we're proud of here in Tucson, so uh, take advantage of that. A um, little background on me, very quickly. Chris Schmaltz is my name. I'm Deputy, Deputy General Counsel at the Tucson Airport Authority. Uh, our General Counsel is Sarah Meadows. We are the two in-house lawyers for the Tucson Airport Authority. Some of you may know me um, from previous iterations of my life. I was a partner in a law firm in Phoenix, and then I was outside General Counsel as part of that law firm, I was outside general counsel for the Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport for a little over six years. Um, yeah, absolutely, here, here, uh, I love that airport. Um, my role at Tucson Airport Authority, very briefly, is all the legal work uh, that Sarah doesn't wanna do, of course. Um, and then I have taken on the role of government affairs at the national and the state level, and I deal locally as well, but mainly national and state level. And so I coordinate at the state level with our lobbyist who um, is active in the aviation world here in Arizona. And on the national level, I go with our CEO um, to Hill visits and to talk to the FAA and meet with our delegation and host our delegation at the airport. And so I'm involved at both the national and state issues. And so we deal with uh, a lot of the issues that of course you're all dealing with um, all the time. Um, and on the national level, sort of there are a few areas of focus that we've been uh, addressing with our delegation and others. Um, and those include implementation of the FAA reauth reauthorization bill, uh, now law, right? Uh, last fall, uh, that was passed. It contains roughly 18 topic areas that directly deal with what we do as airports. And so those topic areas include security, procurement, 
tweaks to PFC. The biggest thing that um, has been a hot button issue that I know we all have been dealing with is how the FAA is involved in non-aeronautical property and the development of non-aeronautical pro property, right? So the reauthorization law contains what we think as airport lawyers and airport people provided more clear guidance with regard to the now hopefully limited role in uh, the treatment of and the evaluation of non-aeronautical property because we all have that, right? And we all want to use it to maximize revenue and to contribute to the economic development engine that is the airport and to provide employment, all of which is a public policy question, right? That the politicians love and that airport people love locally and that the national delegations love because we are able to then talk to them about here's what we're doing at our airport that's just not just narrow airport, right? If, we be, uh, if, if part of our message is economic development and employment, um, politicians' eyes light up when you're in the room. And so part of the effort that we do at the Tucson Airport Authority is connect all those dots and part of the FAA reauthorization bill allows for us to communicate that message, which is we are an economic engine, and it's not just because it's direct airport, airline, other users of the airport. It is non-aeronautical uses. And those provisions in the FAA reauthorization law are intended to, because I was part of the committee that worked on it, right? It's intended to pull back a little bit from the FAA's role in evaluating and approving sort of what we can do with our self-funded, non-federal funded land that we have that's non-aeronautical. So that's one of the key issues, and we can certainly talk about that in the Q&A, um, to deal with that FAA reauthorization now law. Uh, the other thing that we're focused on, of obviously, at the federal level is removing the PFC cap. That has been an ongoing conversation. It has been an ongoing sort of topic for years now, right? And the opportunity, I, I say this all the time, and people look at me with um, incredulity, is now is an amazing time to be in government affairs. Why? Um, because if you sit in a room with policymakers and decision makers and legislators, and your message is one of clarity and simplicity, and the policy message that you can deliver is, resonates, their eyes light up and they respond. Why? Because there is so much noise, obviously, right now in that world that being able to talk about policy decisions and choices that have a real impact on constituents and users of the airport across a broad spectrum, that is money that is beneficial to all users of the airport, right? And if that message is communicated to legislators, that's a successful job. You've done your job by communicating that simple message. And the PFC messaging is simple. It hasn't been changed since 2000, right? The buying power of it is dramatically reduced. It needs to be changed. And here, and uh, again, it, it, it resonates with our delegation here in Arizona because it's local money that is spent locally on local projects, right, that are at our airport that benefit people here and at your airport. It's a simple message. If I encourage you to do anything with regard to supporting the PFC cap removal effort, it is to distill your message to that, that it is local money, local decisions on, on things that directly benefit the users of the airport. And they love to hear that message because I can sit down and go through the bullet points and they have to deal with all kinds of stuff all day long, lots of noise, sort of political noise, right? But if you're able to sit down and directly deliver that kind of message, they are very appreciative of exactly that because it's a simple thing. Everybody's nodding their head about, you're in the room and everybody's nodding your head and you know that makes complete sense. Well, obviously, politics are involved and it's difficult to get over the hump. But I, I will highlight to you the, the Massey bill that was dropped. It's H.R. 3791. H.R. 3791. 
Google that. Google it with PFC, sponsored by Representative Massey. That is the vehicle by which, and there, are, there have been multiple attempts, right? Um, there was an attempt last year to attach it to the FAA reauthorization bill. It did not get included. This is the direct bill that will be the vehicle by which, from the House side, um, that PFC uh, cap uh, will attempt to be either increased or removed. Um, the other thing that we're uh, dealing with at the national level is the um, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on Commercial Space and the regulations involving commercial space. We have a facility here in Tucson that is called um, Spaceport Tucson. It's not a licensed spaceport. Uh, the county built it, rented it out to Worldview Enterprises. You've probably heard of them. Um, Spaceport Tucson um, is close to, I'll, I'll say, close to the runway of our airport. Um, and they plan on doing balloon-related launches from, uh, and have done um, balloon-related launches from uh, that uh, spaceport. Um, and so we are, as an airport authority, uh, concerned about and interested in, obviously, in the FAA's rules associated with commercial space. And that's a huge topic these days. And it's a huge issue for multiple airports around the country in terms of how do we safely blend commercial space activity into the national airspace while at the same time protecting sort of the other users of our airports, right? And so the notice of proposed rulemaking, the comments on that have been extended a couple times. The current deadline is August 19th. Um, for that, if you aren't aware of that Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, I strongly encourage you to take a look at and Google that Notice of Pro Proposed Rulemaking on commercial space and commercial space launch and reentry rules. Um, one of the fascinating things uh, that's part of my job is when the county decided to um, build this facility close to our airport, I immediately had to become a commercial space license expert, right? So both for a facility, licensing for the facility itself, and then licensing for the vehicles, launch and reentry. And I love my job because of the very myriad um, things that I get a chance to look at. We have trespassing cattle the other day, so I became an expert in Arizona cattle law. That was awesome. Arizona's laws are written to the benefit of ranchers. <laughs> Shocker, right? Um, so, um, so the commercial space is a key issue, and I'm, I can talk about that all day as well. Uh, one of the highlights of following that commercial space, sort of those rewriting of the regs, was a quote from, I just, uh, I'll highlight this, Eric Stalmer is the president of the Commercial Space Flight, space Flight Federation, Space Flight Federation. This is a industry group that's made up of heavy hitters, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Worldview, Vector, who's in Tucson also, um, Axiom Space. Um, the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation testified at a subcommittee dealing with space that, quote, he, these are worse than today's obsolete rules. That's from the president of the Federation that was part of the committee that helped to provide guidance on these new rules. So the environment is fascinating from a public policy perspective because from the, and, there, and it's not, that's not a universal view from the space, commercial space industry. There is a divide in the commercial space industry about what they want in terms of rules. Some of the commercial space folks are, they are supportive of the change because anything new that tries to address what they're trying to do is good from their perspective. But a large portion of the commercial space industry that is comprised of heavy hitters is saying that those rules are worse than what we've currently got. So that's a conversation that will obviously continue. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight with regard to state um, regulation and legislation is the Arizona legislature is an adventure. Um, when we have lots of money to spend, the revenues are all up. Uh, Representative Teller can speak to this. Um, it's harder when there are more revenue 
because everybody wants a piece, right? The state uh, legislature has for a l and, and governor's office has been long time sort of governed by um, limited government, limited regulation, cut back on spending, sort of a lot of that, right? Um, part of the thing that I've helped to guide with regard to the uh, advocacy effort that we do at the state is make sure that anyone we're in front of, we connect the dots with regard to the money that is spent by the state, the limited money that is spent by the state in the aviation fund and otherwise, infrastructure, um, has to also be connected to education funding. Because we get complaints all the time at our airport, and I'm sure you hear this as well these days, they are having a hard time finding employees. And why is that? Because they're not schools are not producing enough educated workforce to work for our tenants at the airport. And so one of the efforts that we've included, which I strongly encourage you to include in your talking points when you're talking to your legislators, is education funding. Because you can draw a straight line from the education funding that the government spends, the state government spends, to support our edu educational system to people who are hireable at the high paying, quality jobs at our airport. Part of our messaging to our legislators and to the governor's office is exactly that. Airports are an economic engine, they are employers, and you have to be funding at an early age, early in the system, STEM education, supporting all of that, all the time, because what comes out of that system is somebody that one of our high aerospace companies or aviation companies, they want to hire. One of the huge successes of our l state session this year was $15 million from the budget, in the budget, to fund the Pima Community College aviation program that's at our airport. They got an extra $15 million to expand that. Why do we need to expand that here at our airport at Pima Community College? Because our tenants, Bombardier, Raytheon, Aerovation, others, demand employees, and they have a hard time finding them. The folks who graduate from that PEMA aviation program are immediately hired, are immediately hired. And so that extra $15 million was a huge success for us as a community. We advocated for it, the college advocated for it, um, because it helps them to double that program and produce um, uh, employees who are immediately hireable in those high paying quality jobs. And so again, that reinforces the messaging that we at Tucson Airport Authority do, as well as what I encourage you all to do, is connect those education dots. Funding by the state is not just direct airport or aviation related funding, education as well supports exactly what we do. And the final thing that I'll touch on in terms of a story is the amazing sort of tale of the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing fight that we had at the legislature uh, this session. Uh, some of you may be aware of it. I was in the trenches on it with our lobbyist. There were two competing bills. One was the Turo bill. The other was the Enterprise bill. Um, and so they were, I'm, I went to multiple stakeholder meetings. Um, ultimately, neither bill got through the legislature. Um, the Turo model was based upon our governor was all uh, in favor of TNCs, passed legislation um, supportive of TNCs, and TNCs have been hugely successful at TAA. Our customers want it. It produces huge revenue for our airport and airports all over the country, right? So um, huge success. So the Turo approach was to model their statute, their bill, on the TNC model, that we are not a car rental company, we are just a facilitator of a transaction, et cetera, et cetera. And so, knowing that there would be fertile ground with regard to that approach, that's how they sort of went after it. Certain, that bill, we, our lobbyist, um, I, did a good job of making sure that that included language that had an airport carve out, right? In terms of preserving our airport authority. But what that, would, that bill tried to establish was statewide that you treat them as peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. We are not a uh, car rental um, enterprise. So the enterprise bill is obviously opposite to that. It is, the, and 
correctly in my mind. Uh, this is a car rental transaction. The main hang-up was insurance and tax treatment um, because we have a tax system in Arizona where stadiums up in Maricopa County especially and some facilities here uh, in Pima County are funded via a tax on car rental transactions. And so it's so fundamental for that constituency, right? Taxing authorities, the stadium authority up in Maricopa County, the stakeholders involved in that were very concerned about how are we gonna treat these 10 transactions um, pr appropriately under our state tax laws. And so ultimately that was the huge hang up that derailed, once they get to a 100 days, you can see people are done up there, they want to get the budget done, they want to get out with their per diem drops, right? So what they get paid per day <laughs> drops, and so they want to leave um, because they're, they got less money. Um, and so at, it was one of those last, because there was a fight throughout the session. Both bills got dropped in, at the beginning of the session, and I went to, up there multiple times to deal with the issues, right, to talk through. And the main hang-up ultimately became how is it treated as a tax in our tax system. And so the none of, neither of them made it across the finish line. I strongly suspect that it will come back next session, hopefully as a compromise bill that everybody's kumbaya about, that appropriately treats them as a... Uh, a rental transaction in some way, but I'm sure given the nature of the environment in our state, there will be some compromise that will be crafted um, in order to get it through the legislature to get a governor's signature. But again, it's my pleasure to be here with you all and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have or, uh, about anything I've touched on or nothing, so thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. So, by the way, that was 135 days in session, and it, it, it seemed like we were all waiting for our parents to pick us up from a summer camp. We were all caged in uh, cabin fever at the end of the session, so, yeah. So we've got uh, right around 17 minutes before lunch, so uh, first hand here, I got the mic. You ready, Joe? Yeah. I'm surprised. Yeah, I know it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, first thing, uh, Orlando, um, I know we know you well here in the state of Arizona and your history with us. Uh, but also briefly, uh, share, uh, that's a word I don't normally use, uh, your transportation experience, your airport experience, what you bring with you for the benefit of our uh, California brethren and sister. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention, uh, which is really important, is uh, that next session I will be introducing an Arizona transportation stimulus plan and what I propose, a $300 million to $600 million proposal that would not only address the, uh, the age infrastructure, the roadways throughout rural and metro Arizona, but also the airports. So uh, what I'm intending is working with, the, with ADOT and Federal Highway uh, in leveraging some of the funds uh, of bond financing. Thank you. You have a background in working for airports too, right? I do. <laughs> any, any other questions? I'd like to um, go on to the point of the peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. I did support that. First, why I didn't support it, because coming from Sky Harbor and Falcon Field, hi, Corinne. Um, I know that the contractual agreements between the rental facility, the rental car companies, and the airport is very key to the revenue of that airport. So um, when Representative Grantham uh, introduced the bill and came to me and said, please, Mr. Teller, support this bill, I read it and I did not support it at first. Uh, and then Representative Chavez uh, introduced another mural bill. And so there was two bills, as the gentleman said. Um, by the end, by the time it got to the floor, they were surrounding me to support the bill. And I sat long and hard for about two minutes, and this came to me. All of us in this room, in this industry, react immediately to changes. And I thought to myself, we will react positively for our airports. So if this bill passes, 
one of the bills pass, all of us in this room will react accordingly almost immediately. That's our innovation that we have in the, commu in the community. So I wasn't afraid of having to respond to AZA or Swahi or AAAE or any of the airport directors, because I know that all of us will react almost immediately, effectively, technically, to addressing that peer-to-peer -peer in our own airport community. That's the confidence I have in us. Uh, if I may, so Chris, you had touched upon uh, the reauthorization, and I, I wanted to take this time to just introduce someone. Uh, Mike Hines, do you mind standing, Mike? Yeah, you. <laughs> So, so Mike, Mike Hines, he's the, he's the manager for our environmental and uh, planning division and headquarters, FA headquarters, and he's going to do a presentation. I don't want to steal his thunder on uh, Section 163 at this conference. That's an unaeronautical land. So I just want to let him know that you're here, Mike, and we're happy that you're here. 315 Salade. <laughs> 315 Salade. Uh, the only thing I would say is that the FA is well aware of the reauthorization. Um, it's it's going to take a little time to kind of figure out how we're going to apply it. Part of it is making sure we understand what Congress intends. The other part is the fact that the department is heavily involved in these things as well. So we have to kind of make sure that you know whatever we're doing fits whatever they want us to do as well. So it, it's going to take a little bit of time. But uh, Mike could be able to talk about the 163, which is very popular for, <laughs> for a lot of airports. So we're happy you met, you're able to come. Joe, you cashed in. You can't. No. And well, I will, let me follow up very quickly about the reauthorization and the especially non to land. One of the things I didn't mention in my sort of brief remarks is, is that that's our, there's already a letter. There's already been a request to evaluate a release of land by the Raleigh-Durham Airport um, under the new regime, under the new law. So that letter, if you want a copy of it, it's research. You can search for it. If you can't find it, I have it. Don't hesitate to reach out to me because it is a response from the FAA to the Raleigh-Durham Airport about the release of land under the new provisions of the reauthorization law and how they applied those provisions in the reauthorization law. It's a very interesting letter. It's a very interesting analysis and that it sheds light on how the FAA is going to approach sort of the the what we sort of what I read the law as requiring and how the FAA is going to implement and apply that to non-aeronautical releases. We, we bought an eight ball. Yes, Joe. Would you say that that was that Raleigh Durham was successful in what they were seeking? Yes, they okay. they re, but the analysis is what is important. Right. Um, the, 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 it was approved because it touched, it checked all the boxes in terms of wasn't funded by the feds, et cetera. Yeah, but then crazy. there was sort of an interesting couple paragraphs about the FAA still sort of clinging to <laughs> a little bit of control, right? Yeah. And so the question will be how does that evolve in terms of what we think the law says? and how the FAA approaches exactly ap the application of those provisions. It'll be an interesting sort of evolution, um, but the Raleigh-Durham was first out of the gate in terms of applying for and receiving approval um, under the new uh, reauthorization law. And it won't surprise me, as we've seen with other things, that there could be some uh, variation from region to region, you know, in their, uh, how they interpret that, but. I think you're right. I know that that's, that hopefully that's not what's going to happen, but... Uh, well, first of all, that never happens. Yeah, okay, I, good. I'm glad we got that clear. No, actually, Mike, Mike's going to talk about that. Mike Hines yeah. to, Right now, everything is going up to headquarters, and, and, Mike, and Mike, Mike has the lead on this. The presentation that was done at the FAA conference was splendid on sort of how they're digging into that and how they're evaluating, and it's truly a... I think I used the term in, the, in that session over there that it's a kind of a quagmire that they're trying to sort out. But anyway, good, good work on the part of the FAA, in my opinion. My only question to you, Mark, is have you heard uh, Mr. Schaefer spoke about any additional funding uh, that is uh, supplemental funding that, that's going into the AIP program, uh, basically just going into the AIP program without the previous supplemental process? Have, has there been any uh, decision made on that? There, there's been lots of communications, but there's been no decision, and uh, when, that, when that is made, it's going to come from the secretary, yeah. so we're just right, waiting. Right, right, so we're just waiting for the secretary to decide. 
So before uh, the end of this session, I'd just like to express uh, that um, to all of us that are in this room um, in the states that we represent, that Aviation Day shouldn't be just one day out of the legislative session. It should be every day. I highly recommend that um, you, uh, as representatives of, of the airport and of the city and the uh, industry, that you constantly remind your legislators how important the airport is in your community and how much money the airport brings and how much employment that brings. As mentioned before by um, my colleagues here, you know, education is really important, yes. Also, funding is just equally as important. So expressing that, addressing it, and meeting with your legislators almost quarterly or more is really important so that they remember you they hear your uh, challenges, you come with recommendations, they will take and, um, and use your recommendations into a bill, or even just ask your legislators to uh, recognize in a proclamation of your airport and how important your airport is to the community and to the state. So that is my call to you, uh, Arizona airports, is come meet with me, I'd love to introduce a proclamation to recognize you and your community and your airport so that we remind my colleagues in the House chamber how important this industry is to the economy of the state. Thank you. I, I can't reinforce that or echo that enough. As someone who does this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, politics and decision-making are about relationships. Um, and having a relationship with your state and national representatives is huge because they know you, they know what you do, being able to communicate with their staff and them specifically about um, what you do and your contribution and the money and the, the impact that the money that's appropriated and the policies that are changed have on real users of the airport. You are the voice of that, we are the voice of that, right? And so being able to sit down with them and have that conversation with the person who's going to be casting the vote on the topic, if they haven't had a conversation with you about that topic, they are hearing from the airlines, they are hearing from others that do not have your interest in mind. And if you have a relationship with them, you can change the outcome. You absolutely can. And so if you're not hosting your state legislators and your national legislators at your airport, giving them tours, making sure that you communicate with them about policy priorities in a simple, clear way, you're not doing a good enough job. If, if I could just give a federal perspective on that as well. So, so coming from a different region, um, that was very commonplace for the state and, lo and, and, and federal legislators to be interested in the airport to approach FAA, asking for support for this and that. We don't get much of that in this region. When, we, when they do talk to us, they're listening to the constituents who are complaining about noise, who want the airport shut down, who want to build a Walmart right next to the airport that's <laughs> not in the interest of aviation. Those are the people who are reaching uh, these folks, and there's, there's not as much advocacy from those groups that we need in this region. So I, I, I agree. Yeah, so a, a, good, a really good example is in 2012, when um, we, were in, we were invited to the opening of the FAA ADO office, and right outside the office, myself and a wonderful mentor uh, said, Orlando, let's go change the law. And that was Corinne, and we made that decision outside the door, and Corinne kicked that door down, and we, uh, with Senator Jack Jackson Jr., who's also my mentor, um, introduced a bill, SB 1317, and allowed uh, tribal nations to partake in the Aviation Fund Program. Again, innovation, discuss discussing it even outside the doors of the FAA, and having a colleague support each other in that effort is really important. So the folks in this room have an opportunity to, to revisit the state statute in any state and figure out how we can update it and do a cleanup bill for the benefit of the industry. So I highly recommend that, thank you.
Well, that sounds like a great wrap up. So please join me one more time in thanking Orlando, Mark, and Chris. Thank you. Thank you.